Finding owls takes hard work and sometimes lengthy hours. To do it right, you need patience, persistence, and you should keep ethics in mind. Once you put in the work, though, the end result is incredibly rewarding. Hello, friend. I'm Luke, and this is Psyched for Nature. Today, we're going to talk about how you can find owls and what you can do to help conserve these elusive and iconic birds of prey. I wish that I could say that I'm coming to you as an expert with many years of experience and I've perfected the form, but I'm just a student who's still learning every day. Um, but hopefully through this video, you can find tools that help empower you to get out into the field and find owls. So let's get started. First thing, a little background. Until relatively recently, I thought of all owls as being pretty much the same, with some exceptions. But I could not have been more wrong. There's no such thing as a standard owl. They come in all shapes and sizes, with some as small as a sparrow and others as large as an eagle, and their behaviors vary just as much as their forms. It's a matter of debate just how many species of owls there are, but they are everywhere. And some can live in urban spaces while others need wide open natural ranges. But no matter where you live, you probably have several species of owls living near you. Today we will explore how you can find these cryptic avian predators. So throughout most of my life, I imagined owls as only being awake at night and only outside spooky Scooby-Doo mansions or haunted forests. But actually only about 60% of owls are nocturnal. The rest are diurnal, meaning they're awake during the day, or crepuscular, which is one of my favorite words. It means that they're active at mostly dawn and dusk. Here's a cool tip that you can use to impress your friends. You can actually tell what time of day an owl hunts the most by just looking at the color of its eyes. Your quick cheat sheet is dark eyes for nocturnal, orange eyes for crepuscular, and yellow eyes for diurnal. Owls have incredible senses of sight and hearing, and I would say that they have unmatched stealth. If you don't know anything about their incredible adaptations yet, I would recommend going to the videos that I put in the description first. Now let's focus on how to actually find owls. Let's go. Friends, before you go anywhere, please make sure that you know what owls live in your area. Don't just wander off into the woods like I do. It seems basic, but identifying species in your area and their behaviors with just a little bit of research is absolutely essential. One of my favorite sources for learning about North American birds is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. I'm going to focus on the owls of Pennsylvania because that's where I am right now. Oh, also, if you live in the U.S., check out the Game Commission website for your state. For PA, they have profiles on all of the owls that live in my area. So in Pennsylvania, there are eight species of owls that either live in the state permanently or visit in the winter. So there are some great possibilities. If you're a smartphone user, I would recommend checking out the eBird app. You can also find it through an online Google search if you want. When you look into it, it kind of feels like cheating, but it is an amazing resource. It can show you where other birders have spotted owls, and there are so many users, so there's tons of data points. You could also check online message lists or sighting reports, or even contact a local birding organization for tips on where to find owls. But there is no shortage of information out there for you to use. So now you have a good idea of where you're supposed to go, why don't you grab your important equipment and head out? It may seem challenging to try and identify owl habitat, but there are some helpful clues that you can use to figure out where to go. So if you're scouting an area, look for places where hawks generally hunt, because hawks and owls actually fill the same niches just at different times of the day. So like I mentioned before, owls are mostly active at night and dawn and dusk when hawks are going to roost. 
So now you're out in an area that can support owls, since you did your research. In this step, you get to flex your detective muscles. When you're out searching for hawks or owls, pay attention to all the signs and signals around you. There are bound to be plenty to help you in your detective work. So listen to your informants. Utilize your spies in the sky. Be alert to signals from flocks of small, agitated birds. There's a chance they've discovered a hawk or an owl and they're harassing it to make it leave the area. Also listen to your agents on the ground. Chipmunks make specific and identifiable calls for birds of prey, called chucking. Check it out. Kinda sounds like frog calls to me. Squirrels will also make a moan alarm call for aerial predators. Listen here. Now let's talk about the most important signals, actual hard proof of the presence of birds of prey. Look for pellets or whitewash on or around the tree. Whitewash drips down from an owl's perch and can look like someone dripped paint down the trunk of a tree. If you find pellets, which would be amazing, there is a way that you can tell if it belongs to an owl. Owl's pellets actually contain up to 10 times more bones than those of other birds of prey. Now it may seem like common sense, but equipment is essential. If you have them, bring a pair of binoculars or a good zoom camera if you like too. If you're searching for owls in the daytime, they may be resting up in trees, so look for oddly shaped branches or lumps on snags, especially at dawn and dusk. Look especially in areas that are messy, places where you think rodents or insects may thrive, because those may be essential prey items. If you're out at night, look in meadows or open areas where owls may hunt, and be very patient. Owls are silent in flight, like I mentioned before, but you may be able to hear their voices in the night. Make sure that you keep your ears open, and make sure that you can identify their calls when you hear them. If you don't want to try and learn bird calls, you can check out BirdNet, which is like an early version of Shazam, but for bird calls. Personally, I use the Audubon Birds app to teach myself. Now, you can also use playbacks of owl calls to draw individuals closer to you, but this is where we need to discuss ethics. So, let's talk ethics. So, you can lure in owls by playing their calls, or you can at least get them to respond, but you have to be very mindful about when and where you do this, because many areas, like national parks, don't allow you to call for owls because it can be considered wildlife harassment. But why would it be considered wildlife harassment, I hear you thinking to yourself. Well, many bird species use their calls to define their territories. So if you hear a stranger's call, then you think that your territory has been invaded by a competitor. So these birds will then frantically search out this intruder to try and challenge them. And they're no longer performing healthy behaviors when they're doing that, like foraging, caring for their chicks, preening or resting, or otherwise anything else that they need to do to survive. So now they're wasting valuable time and energy searching out a fake bird. Constantly chasing competitors stresses the bird and causes it to waste its energy on a useless task which would impact its survival. So never use calls during the breeding season unless you're part of a legitimate organized survey. And it should go without saying, but don't use them for threatened or endangered species of owls. If you choose to call for owls from your own backyard, here are a few things to remember. First, don't call often. Try maybe once or twice, and then put the calls away for a few weeks. Second, try calling for smaller owls first. That's because larger owls will eat smaller owls. And <laughs> if they hear the vocalizations of a larger owl, smaller owls aren't going to approach. Likewise, if you hear the calls of a smaller owl in your area, don't call for a larger owl, because that could be like ringing the dinner bell, and you would put that small owl potentially in mortal danger. Okay, ethics lesson complete. So now let's focus on what to do when we actually find an owl.
So now it's the moment of truth. You've actually discovered an owl. What do you do now? You have to remain quiet and do everything in slow motion. Sink slowly to the ground to appear less threatening. If the owl no longer feels threatened, you may get to watch it relax. However, if you're too close to the owl, it will fidget and continue to look alarmed. What you have to do is back off slowly and quietly and keep your body small and low. If you find a nest or a roost site and you want to study it, visit infrequently. Study the site from a safe distance with binoculars and don't disturb a nest or roost site by getting too close, even for photos. You don't want to be the reason that a nest fails or a roost is abandoned. Here's some last tips for you. Keep quiet. Owls have incredible hearing, so the quieter you are, the less likely you are to disturb the birds. Keep your distance. Getting too close may alarm or stress the birds and get you attacked. Minimize lights. While you may need a flashlight to see a trail at night, avoid waving the light around to spot an owl. Keep your lights down so you don't disrupt the bird's night vision and make it alarmed and vulnerable. If necessary, shine the light on a nearby branch and only use diffused indirect light to see an owl. If you intend to photograph them, avoid flash photography. And another quick tip, you can strap a thin cloth or tissue or handkerchief over a bright flashlight to keep it dull and diffused. Many owls play integral roles in their environments. And if you'd like to help conserve our stealthy friends, there's no shortage of organizations that you can help support. So check out the work of the Owl Research Institute and other organizations like the Nature Conservancy who are helping to conserve owl habitat and monitor species. You can donate to help owls, but you can also offer your skills and experience to active projects or organizations. Any skill set can be helpful, and there may be projects local to your area. For example, if you're watching this from the Pittsburgh area, the National Aviary participates in Project OwlNet, a project that's working to determine the timing, intensity, and pace of the migration of the northern sawwet owl. Citizen scientists are given the opportunity to participate in the capture and banding process. Lastly, the Hungry Owls Project has worked up a list of 10 things you can do to help owls. Well folks, that's pretty much it. So your next step is to take this information and go off into the field. And don't be discouraged. I hope that you see and hear amazing things. And I'd love to hear in the comments what owls you find and definitely tell me your favorite species of owl. I'd love to know. Um, so if you thought that this video was useful, leave a like and um, subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this in the future. For now, best of luck. And I'll see you next time on Psyched for Nature.